what an opportunity it was to be able to speak to Kate Kennedy about her writing of Like a House on Fire. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience and I'm really excited about being able to share it with everybody who watches uh, the English Lab YouTube channel. So if you are just a fan of Kate Kennedy's, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of today. If you are a student in year 12 who is studying Like a House on Fire, there is so much that she brings up that you can uh, get out of this conversation. I really encourage you to take notes, watch it a couple of times, go back to certain places. Kate has been really generous uh, in giving up her time uh, in order to do this and it was because of the fact that she generally travels to lots of schools and that with COVID happening throughout 2020 she wasn't able to do that in the way that she would like to and so I'd like to say a really big thank you to the fact that she's made this available to anyone who's interested and anyone who is studying her text no matter where they are throughout Victoria or even in Australia. So uh, whether you are looking to write a creative response uh, to Like a House on Fire or you're getting ready for the BCE English exam or for your analytical sack and you're writing an essay, there are some direct questions about how we can analyse symbols and things that exist and metaphors that exist from story to story and there is plenty about the writing process as well that will give you a really great insight into the ideas and the values and those types of things that make up any great analysis of a text. Okay, welcome. Hi Kate Kennedy, how are you going? I am good. How are you guys going? <laughs> Very well, thank you. I want to start off by saying a, a huge thank you uh, on behalf of every student uh, and teacher that is going to watch this video and, and get that extra insight that they need uh, with studying like a house on fire. I really appreciate you uh, giving up your time to, uh, to help all of them out. So all I uh, want to do today is just ask a couple of questions uh, off the bat. Uh, a couple that I was curious about as I was reading through it personally and then a few questions um, that are more sort of pertaining to, to the studying of, of the uh, short stories and, and things that students could use in, in their essays and in their exploration and sort of opening it up to new understanding. So the first uh, question that I wanted to ask was about um, whether you ever read analysis of your own work and ever think to yourself, well, actually, hold on, that, that, that's not what I meant. It's always been something uh, in, in my career as an English teacher, you know, I've often had those arguments with students where they've said, well, how do you know that that's what you meant? And how do you know that that's what, you know, they, they were saying there? Is that ever strange to read, um, I guess, analysis of your work and, and see that people have, you know, interpreted it differently to how perhaps you intended? Yes. And it's one of those things that makes you give away the strictness of your intentions, I suppose, because as you start working with metaphor or imagery or symbolism, you quickly realise that people are taking that in on their own terms and, you know, the thing that gives that momentum in a story is meaning, is meaning. It gives us like a surge of understanding and recognition and, you, and without that little surge of connection, fiction just doesn't really work, I don't think. And if you start to try and control that too much and say, no, no, this is what it means, I'm going to pin it down, I'm going to explain it to you, then of <laughs> course your writing becomes very didactic and it's, it no longer feels good. So you, we yeah. want to have something in there which is embodied under the surface, inviting readers to kind of step into that story. And I always think of it's like you've had a dream and you want to kind of embody the dream and then, and then your reader sort of buys into your dream and, and you're keeping their attention by being in this world that you've made. And of course, there's going to be things in there which, you know, there's a whole bunch of expectations that if, if I mention something twice in a story, you're going to think that's significant, aren't you? If there's a hat. <laughs> I mentioned it two or three times, you think, oh, that hadn't mean something. This is how we kind of project ourselves into the story and try and find that meaning in it. So I don't want to turn that off. I want to keep that that going because finding that meaning on your own terms is just so important to a reading experience rather than a, um, a reading sort of analysis where you're looking for answers as if I've kind of put them in there like a trick of some kind to make some people <laughs> feel smart, some feel stupid. That's the last thing I want to do. I want people to have an experience that that world opens up for them and they see those connections and we all see those patterns that I think we're looking for all the time in stories, you know. Oh, fantastic. I think that's, um, you know, every English teacher across Victoria is probably throwing their hands up saying thank you because that's uh, the type of thing that we're saying. I think sometimes students can get caught up with that idea that there is that answer, as you said, as opposed to, putting themselves and their own experiences and their own understanding of the world into it and, and, and taking uh, from that what they will. 
it's all sort of right answers. And I've got to say, sometimes students have pointed things out to me that I didn't see myself, and I think, wow, retrospectively, I look a lot smarter than I was when I was writing it. Because so you can take credit for it. Across the stories, of course. And they look, for example, one group of students said to me uh, one time, all of, your all of your stories finish on a kind of a moment where someone makes a gesture or their hands do something in that collection. And I thought, oh my God, they're right. It's just a kind of <laughs> default that I'm in, I guess, that I'm trying to create a visual auditory world rather than give that explanation. And so I make somebody do something in order for the student or the reader to kind of have that visual thing in their mind. And of course, I do the same thing every time. So I can say now, I meant that, that pattern. Yeah. <laughs> After the fact, that's great. That's right. I, uh, yeah. I, when you were saying before that you mentioned some things, you know, multiple times, one, the one thing that I was thinking of was uh, in the uh, the second short story from um, Like a House on Fire. That one thing that stood out to me personally was the, um, the feature in the car that would beep whenever he was speeding, uh, Chris, mm. the, the son. And, yeah. and the first time I heard that, I thought, oh, I sort of had my own ideas about, you know, at being like his, his father sort of still being there and that sense of sort of hovering over him and, and being, you know, very over the top and sort of restricting him. And then when it came up a second and a third time, I thought to myself, oh, I think there's, there's probably definitely something there, you know, that, that I could uh, that I could analyse for sure. Yeah. yeah, and that's what happens, of course. By the time you've, you've got lots of happy accidents in your first draft, as students <laughs> will find if they do their own writing, you're just trying to be, um, to explore yourself. Uh, you know, in your first draft as a writer, you'll feel just as much in the dark as your reader you're in the same position. You're kind of, you know, fumbling your way forward, glimmering towards something. It's never a strategy. It's always this and, well, maybe then this and then, oh, maybe this. And then when you start redrafting and, and editing again and revising, that's where you notice what you've accidentally revealed to yourself. And then this great day happens where you think, I'm going to use that. I'm going to clear away that debris around that. That's going to become a central image. It's like, fantastic thing to happen so if i see it it's an accident but only for a while after that you can pretty much be sure everything in a published short story is there deliberately for a reason to show you something i think that's uh that's fantastic advice because i know that um a lot of schools uh work analytically with like a house on fire in writing text response essays to it but yep. a lot of schools also use it as their creative um, uh, the, the, the new study design, or not so new anymore, uh, study design has that creative element. So I think that advice that you said there about sort of working in the dark when, when you're writing these things, I think could work really well for students as well in that they don't have to have it all figured out before they put pen to paper, that there might be things that will come to them as they're writing that, that they'll actually pick up on and think, oh, I could, I could go with that, I could work with that. You know, I always think to myself in that the um, thinking of something and experiencing something are two very different feelings, aren't they? They're different things. Yeah. Like if you're dancing to music at a festival, you're not analyzing what's happening to you. You're just in that sensory world. So in fiction, you're trying to use sensory detail so that students feel like they're there. A reader feels like it's there. So I always think to myself in a critical response, great, explain, explain how things are happening and explain how things are working in the story you know, support your argument by finding things that I've done in the text and say, here's where the image does this. Fantastic. In a short story, you can't explain. You have to no. embody. You have to embody it somehow in what's happening in the story and what's happening inside the character somehow. And that's the really interesting thing. Um, if you're that kind of thinker, that's actually yeah. a pleasure. You know, Absolutely. it's a beautiful thing to do that. Yeah. I think that's uh, that's really, really great advice that uh, that hopefully a lot of students will be able to uh, to take on. I also wanted to ask, um, specifically within uh, Like a House on Fire, do you have a story, I don't want to use the word favourite, but uh, more of a story that, that out of the lot of them that really uh, is one that you know, aligns with you the, the most or one that you feel sort of closest to? Or is it a case of that you have that feeling about everything that, that you write in the, in the stories? Uh, it's like you have a lot of short, great friendships with the stories, I suppose. You get very, yeah. you need to reimburse yourself in an experience or a memory or something that's just tugging at you. They're going to make the good stories, the things that you lie awake still thinking about. And so I guess the ones that I feel fond of are the ones where I've taken something that's happened to me and I've kind of reframed it into fiction because that lets me stop being uh, kind of haunted by it, if you know what I mean. It, it's, yeah. in a, 
Actually, the one I'm talking about is the story called Laminex and Mirrors, about the young woman who's the cleaner at the hospital. Yep. And as you can probably tell from the detail and the description and the, the that's pretty much autobiographical. That was okay. me when I was 18. I was that person. I was a cleaner in the hospital, except I wasn't as brave as my character. I didn't take him out for a cigarette. And I have always regretted not doing it. And I often think to myself, what, what was wrong with me? What was the problem? He died anyway. I got sacked anyway. What difference would it have made? Ugh. Those kind of <laughs> thing up there wrong. And so in a short story, you can give yourself a better ending. Because when you make a fictional character, they're like an avatar of you in terms of your own life experiences. Just take one thing that's happened to you and, and make it happen to somebody else who's not you. And the, yeah. the relief of being able to kind of make something fictional, which I always think is taking something from real life that feels fairly um, random and arbitrary and pretty incoherent. I don't know about you, but I find real life is a jumble of yeah. incoherent oh, life that you yeah. kind of, you know, you were looking for ways to find a narrative through line, you know, that's going to make sense of it. Making a story is a way to make that very coherent and just have the elements that work. And the best ending for that story, as it seemed to me, was do something for him. Make that character step over some threshold. And once again, what are her hands doing at the end of the story? She's pushing him in his wheelchair through those front doors. She's making, and she's, it's like a sacrifice. But in that process, he becomes an adult, really. That's what I remember from that experience of, of that work. But I wish I had done it. And in writing the story, I can put that wish to rest because I let her do it, you know. Well, it becomes almost like a cathartic experience, almost, like yeah. living it out too. Oh, That's great. People talk about really writing love, um... therapy. But writing's not therapy. Writing is that catharsis. You pick up something and you look at it again and you think about it. And I think, oh, I think it's like, it's like you're picking a lock. That's how I kind of see it now. And you're listening to those tumblers and you're looking for the right combination to make something <laughs> happen and a door swings open. So it does feel like, oh, finished, you know, a small little thing has been finished and it feels really satisfying. Yeah. Oh, great. I love I love the moment in, in Laminex and Mirrors where uh, she takes him to the, uh, to the bathroom that she's cleaned in that uh, wing that's going to yeah. be demolished. And I think he says to her, oh, you're a champion or something like that. And when I yeah. read it the first time, I really, I really... Uh, felt something for for the old for the old man and then uh the the audiobook version as well which i've been listening to recently there the uh the voice artists who do that do a really good job of it and you can you really get that sense of that that moment of, of you lowering him into the bath and so on yeah it's a um it's a really really great moment i think that's um that's really really cool that i've uh, i've learned that today but that was somewhat autobiographical that's um that's, quite a uh, few of the stories are autobiographical uh, because Write what you know, I guess. Write what's happened yeah. to you or what you've heard in passing or someone's told you something. And, you know, a big thing about the stories in terms of when I look at them all as a, as a group or a sort of a, a playlist, I kind of see them as, you know, a playlist yeah. that I've made for someone. They've got this kind of, there's sort of like a, a series of tracks, you know, and I look at them and I think, why have I done this and why have I arranged them this way? The same way that you would if you're making a playlist for a friend. You put a bonus track in there and then you, you juxtapose that one against that one because that's going to be a nice surprise to move there. So it's a kind of a, a process of putting together lots of small things. And I look at them and I see themes in them that I didn't set out to write about. I, I never would sit down and think, right, now for a story about redemption. You know, I think that would be a good story, do you know what I mean? But yeah. if I think about now for a story about that job I had when I was 18, when I cleaned those bathrooms that got demolished and that old man was there, you know, and that's what I can do. I can make a little scene and I can start the story. But I see that there are larger themes and there are themes about that very stuff that you're talking about, which is ordinary people uh, whose, whose problems are just as big as anybody's. Um, and and it's, it's the trying to do something or to change or shift or move that kind of makes them kind of extraordinary to me. I, I find that coping or just trying to get by quite heroic. <laughs> the older I get, the more heroic it seems, you know. And I, and I think that's why, you know, as we read them, that's why, you know, you can connect with them so much because they are those those ordinary moments, but occasionally it clicks upon that sort of feeling. I know that that's what I had when I, when I was reading through them. There were certain things that I realised, oh, that's probably not me, but then every once in a while there's that 
thing that happens and you think, oh God, I've felt that. Yeah, I, I know that. I've yeah, that that's I've I've had that experience. You know, not not with exactly what happens, but that that feeling that uh, that you're talking yeah. on. As I that's, said, you're um, looking for experience. Yeah. Yeah. That explanation you just said about. Um, or description as, as a playlist actually um, works really well because what, another thing I wanted to ask you was about, particularly with short stories, um, when you write a collection of short stories, I'm, I'm curious as to whether you are in uh, a similar sort of mood when you write each of them or is it all within a similar window of time? I, I guess what I'm asking is how aware are you as you are writing the separate stories that they'll all end up in the same compilation? No, you can't really think about any more than you're looking at your at all the songs you've got, you think, what's my playlist going to be? You have to just kind of do one and see what occurs to you next, I suppose, what it reminds you of, because one thing kind of triggers something else. Uh, and I, I sort of wrote them over a period of probably eight years, which looking okay. at it now, was kind of one of the longest droughts Australia had ever had. I was living in the, in the country on a farm. I had a child during that time. I lost both my parents to cancer during that time. Lots of things happened that you just where are you going to put those things that happen to you and that's why when right. people say they're only like in year 11 or 12 and they say I've got nothing to write about nothing's ever happened to me my ideas are too weird anyway why would I you know I hear a lot of that kind of yeah. resistance because that's exactly the stories that I want to hear from students is the stuff that you don't know what to do with it or where to put it or how to process it you can process mm -hmm. it one by one in a story you can make it about one thing. That's the beauty of short fiction. It just has to be about one thing. You don't have to talk mm. about the whole human condition and everything you feel about it. Just make one little story about that and then write another one. And then bit by bit, you've found you've made a sort of a, I don't know, a little bit of kindling or something or a little <laughs> a little stack or something. I don't know what you've made. It's a, it's a story collection. It's it's its own self, you know. Um, but so you do you do get to a stage of seeing those larger concerns and as you start to put them together I think you you notice as I said it's like you accidentally reveal something to yourself and that revelation is as much of a surprise to you in fact that's what you want because you can pretty much guarantee if it's a surprise to you it's going to be a surprise to your reader as well mm. a little surge of recognition that's what you want you know that's you want something that's going to give somebody the jolt that something's given you and a yeah. short story is a perfect little jolt you know Absolutely, I think that's I think that's really uh, refreshing for for students to hear, particularly when they are writing creatively. That it's it's you know as you said before, you don't you know, I'm not going to you know sit down. All right, I'm going to write about this theme and this idea. That it is that personal thing, and that they can stumble upon those things that have happened to them that will you know lead them to that sort of creative writing. Yeah. The thing I've um, written in some notes, and I would always say to students is um, small and specific is going to trump big and generic and vague every time but often in school the way we get taught is from a theme someone gives us a theme and it's a great big thing you know it's war or it's divorce or it's peer group pressure or something I don't know how anyone could ever start a story with a theme that's just like a rock face that you can't find a handhold on whereas you know if you take something big and generic and just make it really small and specific I always think of it as crunching time and space crunch down so it's not two people go shopping, it's people go shopping and one of them shoplifts something, you know, and let's make it, <laughs> let's make it the point of view is the person at the pharmacy who sees them. And bit by bit, you kind of zoom the camera in to make it small and specific. And then it can be something in your reader's head which feels immediate and real and visual. A little movie starts in their head. And that's, yeah. a, that's a fantastic kind of um, uh, thing to give to somebody because that's yeah, where it exists. That's it, it, the marks on the page are not the story. And the story I thought of isn't even the story. The story exists in the head of the person who reads it. You know, it's kind of a miracle in a way. <laughs> yeah, I think that I, I love hearing that in that um, because I think when uh, students are looking at it analytically, they, they, they sort of look at the stories. And, and sometimes I think particularly with short stories, they're, they're looking at it you know, sort of after a bit of a classic narrative of that, you know, beginning, yeah. middle and end and a climax yeah. and so on. And, and I think sometimes it can take that time to step back and say, well, in terms of actual, you know, action, in terms of what happens in terms of a plot, there might not be lots in this story, but rather it's about, okay, why is there that tension between that mother and that son? And slowly we get, you know, some some clues and so on. And I think 
uh, it takes students sometimes a little while to, to to burst through that and have that understanding that it's this you know moment in time that it's this splice but but everything that happens in that moment reveals so much about that relationship or that person or, or how they feel that's right and in a short story of course here's one little pivot will do it so the thing that has to happen in every story no matter how small or big is that we don't end up in the same position when we started because that feels like nothing has happened so it may be a small change that's happened but it's always going to be a change of some kind and the best place for the change to happen is is it's like a transformation inside the narrative viewpoint character that's where we want to see the change so i'm always trying to find something in a story where i slow your attention down around that point where we pivot where a change takes place I want you to pay attention to every second of that moment. And every story has got that moment where things are going along this way and then something happens and now we see that we can't go back to what it was before. Because of some mm. revelation maybe or because of a realisation or because of a blurting thing or because something happens or someone does something, anything can be that pivot. But there will be a switch in power or there'll be a switch in understanding or something. And that's what makes it feel more satisfying, I think. Okay. Are there are there any um, instances where you might do? Ha, there might be more than one of those moments within a story. Um, well, it builds towards the major one, and the yep. trick about the major one, you know, that, and if you look at story structure the, from the Greek, that's what the word crisis means, not catastrophe. It means decisive moment. So you okay, have to yep. try and make that decisive moment for yourself, where the character decides something. I'm making it sound a bit glib, I know, but it's not complicated. It's actually beautifully simple. And yeah. only one of those things has to happen because after that happens, you can't have another whole, unless you're having a novel, of course, then you have yeah. a whole, but even that goes up into a, into a pinnacle one. If you think about your favourite movie or something, it starts small and it kind of gets worse until everything changes, you know, and the characters, whatever's happening internally for the character kind of erupts out into the world, okay. comes out into the it becomes manifest so that might be a little epiphany maybe in a short story but only one thing has to happen and then we then we just kind of you know the, the camera kind of pulls back then and what yeah. we see is the change that has happened yeah and i think yeah you know, i think that's that's great for students to be hearing because i know that lots of english teachers work on that idea of okay let's take some evidence as to who this character was at the beginning of, of the yeah. story and then what they understand, how they see, how they see the world differently, how they see themselves or those that they're close to differently, oh. come the end of it. I, the the reason that I asked that question, as you were saying about those crucial points, I was thinking about the first story, um, Flexi, and when, and I was trying to think to myself, well, okay, is it the gesture at the end and the, and the hand on the heart, or is it the the accident itself that changes everything? But then, one of the key moments I really saw with that was when she was thinking about it in the hospital, and she has that thought where she thinks uh well i guess she almost ends up feeling guilty about it but she almost feels bad about the fact that he's going to recover and that yeah. it's going to be better than what she thought and therefore her life is going to be worse uh, for her in that moment she wants him to die actually and, yeah. and there's a yeah and, and the, the moment i feel like i've slowed you down in that story is when he's home from the hospital and they're kind of seeing how it's going to be and he's sitting at the table and she's cut his hair and um and then she's get on that phone and and Thank people, he's not thing, and she gets the mirror, and and she says, "Have a good look and get on that phone." And what you realise is there's been a power shift. You know, he cannot get up and come around the table. The implication being he's always been more powerful than her, and possibly even you know, quite intimidating or violent towards her. But now she has got the power, and she feels that power surge through her. And I've got to say too, that's one example of not just a pivot point, but one example where a student has said to me. Um, is that a symbol of Samson and Delilah from the Bible? Because in the Bible, um, Samson gets his hair cut by Delilah and he loses all of his power and strength. And I said, well, that's a really good idea, but it didn't occur to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they could go for it with their analysis anyway. It's been, uh, yeah. it's been verified now that that's, that's the interpretation we're going with. <laughs> Sometimes that in a story is a turning point. And often what you're showing at the end is um, some gesture or some moment, which is hopefully that change embodied in some way, where you see what might happen next, or you make a decision yourself. You weigh in as a reader about what seems likely that might happen next, 
even that little moment in Ashes where he just brushes that bit of um, ash off his mum's lapel. That's that's his dad. That's a little bit of his dad's ashes. And it's a little gesture of conciliation or tenderness or kindness that probably wasn't there at the beginning when he was grinding his teeth with resentment um, <laughs> about having to do this. There's something that's kind of shifted in him. And I guess in a story, you've only really got time. You've only got a few thousand words. It's actually, it's harder to do it in a in a small space than it is to do it in a big space because you somehow have to make a frame that your reader will look into that door frame when you open it and get a glimpse, that, the right glimpse that they need, the right moment or the right day or something. And then you shut the door and the rest they have to imagine for themselves. And they often, students often say, don't you want to go back and revisit those characters again? I was like, no, I just have to assume that their life has gone on a little bit differently than yeah. it was when we first struck them, when they were stuck. You know, mostly they're stuck, aren't they, at the beginning? And then yes. they have to come, often physically stuck, you know, sometimes spiritually or emotionally stuck. But yeah, then they there's a sense that there's going to be movement and shift somehow. So I think that, that could be a, a good a good way for students that are looking to, to access, you know, meaning and to find their own unique interpretation, thinking about that idea of, of characters that are, that are stuck. And as you said, physically or, or, or otherwise, and, and, and what comes to resolve that? Yeah. Is that, yeah. I think that's, um, I think that's the type of thing that can yeah, really help them out. And often the thing has been staring at them in the face all the time, but that's what I mean about it's them having to change. You know, you have to use what's there in the story. So if your little arena of power and freedom is that backyard swimming pool, get into that pool, get back into that world that you feel that you're a different, or if you, um, have noticed suddenly that what your kids have done while you've been lying on the lounge room floor with the bad back and they've been, what they've made is an activity scene out of all their toys. They're going to have Christmas whether you can get up or not. Those <laughs> sorts of things are the moments where oh, the character has a change of heart or an epiphany or a realisation that they have to unstick themselves somehow. And then yeah. I'm happy to leave it, you know, leave it at that, you know. I love that way of looking at it, that idea of them being stuck in that, in that moment and, and then, then moving to that new realisation. I had um, just a, a couple of questions that uh, a few people, a couple of teachers and some students have put to me and it's more about looking at it uh, analytically. Uh, the first one came from uh, a lady named Merida who said, what does Kate see as the in point for students, i.e., you know, the hook that they can relate to or the ouch moment? Hmm. I suppose um, I'm... The ouch moment that I'm trying to find there is something that's, I hate to use the word relatable because I think it's a very, it's like likeable, it's like, Ugh. but <laughs> it's something that anyone can look at and think, yeah, I've been there, I get that. I have felt that moment too. And we've all had that because we've all survived childhood. So we've all survived the ultimate powerlessness and, you know, boredom and love and euphoria and all those things. We know those things. And yet I think we're all pretty ordinary people with a base sort of self. That is, we know is different from the self that we uh, present to the outside world. And between those two selves, that hidden self that we prefer to keep hidden, crisis is what reveals it, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. and the outside world, we're stepping or learning to step back and forth between those two selves all the time. And I think that's the interesting territory of where um, you can put pressure on a character. So to me, I think how it happens at the end point is someone's just going along and there's a disruption. Something happens. There's disrepair or there's um, a moment of um, disarray or something like that. There's a knock on the door. There's an invitation or there's a, you know, you hurt yourself or, or you, you miss the bus or something like that. And suddenly you're off on another trajectory. So I look at that as a way for me to make something start happening in the story. And when something starts happening, I think that's when people start paying attention because they think, what are they going to do next? Yeah. And bottom underneath that question comes the next one, which is, what would I do if that was me? You can't help but think those two things together. So my in point oh. is, how can I put you in that space to make you think that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I really like that. I think that's so valuable. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, with, uh, with students watching this and thinking about how they can analyse the text. Because as you were saying that, I was thinking of all these moments of these characters that I can think of that 
there's this way that they project themselves to the world and, and the way that they want people to see them in their lives and, and all these things. And then we have that reality. And, and, and you mentioned Ashes before. I always found that, you know, quite heartbreaking that, you know, that his mother, you know, talked about oh, all those camping trips and he's sitting there in the car going, we went twice and it was awful. And, and it's that idea of what she's going to present to, you know, to the book club ladies. And, and then you think about how, um, you know, the Frank from the first story, how he is to, uh, to everybody else. And then he's this pretty horrible guy or more than pretty horrible. He's this awful man, you know, in, in his own home. And so I think, um, I think that's a, a really great way for students to be able to see that idea across texts and, and to see how there are those moments that truly reveal, you know, I guess the truth of what's happening uh, in these people's yeah. lives. There's such a good question to ask about that ouch moment because they're all about the ouch in a way, aren't they? The, the moment yeah. where the cost of hiding something becomes greater than the cost of risking it in the world, I suppose. And that's why at the beginning of the book, there's a little epigram by Kafka that says, in the battle between you and the world, back the world, you know, <laughs> because we're not going to win against yeah. that. That guy in ashes is just going to have to tolerate. That's his mum. That's the way things are going to be. doesn't matter how much you resentfully internally, you know, simmer and fester away, deal with it, you know. Yeah. Deal with it. That's how, it, that's reality. So I always feel like we all kind of go into the world thinking we're going to change the world, but in fact, the world changes us. We don't get what we want. We get something mm -hmm. else and it, it alters us. And so I think it's such a good question because that is the giving away of something, which is our loss, isn't it? That is the bruise, that's the ouch. The loss of something and the yeah. getting of something. You know. Yeah, I think that that leads me to to something that I was I was personally thinking was when you when you were talking about uh, the characters having to accept these things. I I, I sort of uh, have spent a lot of time, you know, in in teaching English to students about saying, you know, it's not about your personal judgment or whether you think the character's good, bad, or otherwise. But I really couldn't help, um, you know, disliking many of the characters or finding yeah. them. Um, you know, but then I guess on, on subsequent readings, what, what I find is that that frustration, my, my reading of it was that I was, I was sort of looking at, well, what's made them that way? And, um, you know, they, and, and in, in the first story we've, we've talked about a little bit, but when, when they talk about, you know, going out of town and, and losing the baby and so on, and I always think, what was he like before that? You know, was he loving and caring? And was that the thing that's broken him and he can't deal with it? And, and no. I, you know, I think when you try to sympathise that little bit, there's there's plenty of ideas there about you know these people that that have these um, you know awful awful behaviours or irritating or frustrating behaviours, but you you begin to start to think, well, what's led them to be that way? Mm. And and um, the other thing about if you know that that expression of be kind, everyone is carrying a great burden, you know. We never know what's going on for other people. We don't know what's happening in the life of the person who cuts in front of us in the car park at the supermarket or the person who packs our bags or the person who is the nurse who fixes up our broken ankle or the person who drives the bus. What's the name of the person who drives your bus to school? You know, you don't know because those people are just invisible to you. They're just mm. things in your way, really, because we're all very, very self-focused. We think what I want, what I'm gonna get. Get out of my way, I'm getting what I wanna get. And yet yeah. those invisible people who are fallible, yes, and annoying and human, you know, yeah. flawed, um, I, I love them. I love them. And, and for the nine minutes that I've got your attention, um, when you're reading one of my stories, I want you to pay attention to them. Maybe I haven't named them for a reason. Maybe it's because we never named them. And it's been so strange during COVID to kind of have, to think about these invisible people and to say, just pay attention to the person who is in the grocery store stacking those shelves. That person has a life. They have complex things going on inside them that they're not sharing with you. All you're seeing is someone in your way. It's funny how those are the people who we've actually recognised during the pandemic as essential mm. workers. They are essential workers. We just don't notice them too much. And so I want to notice them more. And they're the characters that I find myself returning to again and again because they're fallible, because they want something and they can't get it. Often not even aware themselves what it is that they want, but I think that's the beginning of a character. If you can do a story and you look at it and you think, who wants what and why can't they get it? You're on, you're on your way to writing a story. It's about desire and not getting what you want because the mm. world doesn't work that way. So what do you do then? What does that reveal about you? 
that's how you're going to make that change happen in a little story. And I love reading those myself. And I would love to read as many of those as people could write because those people have become my kind of heroes because they cope yeah. somehow. They may not yeah. win, they may fail, but they try. And it's the trying to me which is now I see as being quite heroic. Okay. I, yeah, thank you. I really, um, yeah, I really, I really like that, that idea of, yeah, of, of coping and, 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 and that, that effort that it, that it takes in order to, to do those things. A, a, a couple more, Kate, if, I, if, if you don't mind. I just wanted to ask about, we had a student that asked about uh, things that they could use that are links between the texts, be they symbols or elements or things that you would uh, see within the text that you think, well, here's some of these, uh, the, these ways of linking the stories together. Sure, um, that's a really good question. I would say I, um, I focus a lot on finding a, um, a kind of a central metaphor of some kind that the character may or may not be aware of. So an object or a thing usually is in the stories uh, that appears and may reappear again. And then I kind of grab hold of it and see what I can do with it. So it might be something like um, that mirror in that story and the idea of what a mirror gives us in terms of seeing ourselves and showing it out to somebody else. It might be that pool, a central metaphor like that, making that whirlpool, because that little vortex is your little arena of power. It might be something quite incidental, like an image that makes that world spring up in your reader's head. I'm trying to find a way to, to put it together so that when I say that Mr. Morton coughs like an old engine that won't quite start, I'm hoping that you make those connections that you think, oh, he's not got very long to live, rather than me saying, he sounded really sick and I thought he was going to die. I don't want to write in that didactic way. I want to write in a way which is suggestive and, and kind of image rich to make that visual auditory world. So I'm looking for details all the time that do that. And across the stories, I would say, I'm trying to find that pivot point where everything gets slow. I try and put my imagery around that central point. So that if there's going to be a metaphor, that's where I'm going to say, pay attention to this. What are people doing in this most raw of moments? What are they doing now? What are they thinking? What's going on? What, what, how's that manifesting itself? What's their body doing? And then I try and find um, something. So from beginning to end, when you finish the story, you get a sense of it um, closing and finishing. So the story might start with someone setting mousetraps and it might finish with someone unsetting the mousetraps yeah. because I want you to see that during the framework of that story, the significant thing has taken place for her. She stayed up all night and I look at those again and I was just watching the other day, I was looking at that last line in that story, um, Tender, because yeah. uh, I was making a little short film of it and I was looking at the last bit and I noticed I had used even a word that I was suddenly, I realised when she's taking the mousetraps apart again, doesn't want any, any mice to, to die, it says, she, put, she it makes a benign little snap. The word benign in the context of the story takes on another whole sort of, yeah. well, she wants that lump to be benign and not malignant. She's terrified that it's gonna be cancer. And she's going down to cope with that by herself. So she's making herself prepared and brave. That's what she's doing. She's like a, a knight before battle, you know, getting herself prepared. So I'm trying to find something which, creates a beginning, middle and end. Not always chronological, but um, creates a nice sense of, um, you know, not, not just that it's coherent, but that it's kind of cohesive. That everything yeah. is there for a reason and it kind of fits together. So I'm looking across the stories, I can see connections that I didn't see when I was writing them, but there's nothing like, oh, this Helen must be this Helen later. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I was just with the name and stuff. It'll always be an object or a thing or a realization or a gesture or an embodiment of some kind. And that will keep reappearing about fallibility or loss or something like that, yeah. Okay. Oh, terrific, I think there's um, there's plenty that, that you've brought up today that, that, that students would be able to see, you know, as you talked about with, you know, the metaphor or, or those objects and that, you know, the, the slowing down and the focus and those pivot points. I think there's yeah. there's plenty there that they'll uh, that they'll be able to, to, to sink their teeth into when, they, when they're analyzing. Um, finally, uh, Kate, I just wanted to ask, I mean, we've, we've talked about a, a whole bunch of ideas um, here today. Is, is there one sort of idea or, or message that, that you feel is more prominent than others that really comes out uh, through the stories? 
Um, I, I guess the message is, um, is just one of, of that we're fallible. And because we're mm. fallible, we're kind of forgivable. So just lighten up, be better, be nicer, be kinder to yourself and kinder to each other because there's no other way home. You know, there's no other way out of this but to accept that we are quite small and powerless individuals. It doesn't matter what kind of tantrum you have, the universe does not care about your tantrum. You have to get up and do the washing up now. That's what's left. You know what I mean? You have to get on. You can't fall in a heap because the world is showing you your, what, what you need all the time. It keeps telling us and telling us again how we have to change and we resist, we resist and we can get dragged kicking and screaming towards that. But I really wanted, and even in the greater shape of the collection, if you want to have a look at how it's all put together on the playlist, it begins with a break. It begins with an unexpected catastrophe. You know, something turns over, literally. Something mm. is overturned and we're upside down and something breaks. And then it finishes at the very last story with that little girl's journal where she says, I'm going to come back and get my bird from you when I've got a place to look after it properly. And that's my promise to you. And the next page is just blank, you know. So we kind of begin with someone looking up at the sky, thinking I'm going to die. And someone at the end looking up at the sky like, I'm going to fly in that. You know, yeah. that's what I'm going to get to. So there's those bigger ideas of just hold on, hold tight, you're good. We'll all be good, you know. <laughs> I like that. I think that's that's a great one for so many for so many texts that we study, you know, in the VCE that, that they don't. I think that's quite an uplifting message as well, and and something that particularly for young people to take out of it that idea of, you know, that those those things that they go through and, and having to, to cope and to hold on. So we always the, we're the only person in the whole wide world ever to have those problems or ever to have these feelings. Yeah. Well, this intensity, it's all just about me, but it's not. This is us. This is the kind of primate that we are, sadly. We are so human and I want to kind of celebrate that humanness and I really want to encourage students to, to look at it in themselves and in their own work as well because they are experts on that stuff. We're all experts on this. Not so much for pretending to be on a different planet or, you know, be World War I fighter ace or something like that, but gee, we know what it's like to feel lonely, to feel let down, to feel less than perfect, to have to get up and keep going or get up and try again. We are experts on that thing of our inner self is going to gradually come out into the world so that we can show the world, not our external mask, but our actual unmuted self one day. And life is gonna show us how to do that, you know. Unlikable you, as we are, you know, <laughs> it's gonna be okay. <laughs> I think that that's one thing that I've that I've really got out of uh, personally just from from having a chat today was like when you're saying before that very sort of selfish way that we might have the blinders on and those invisible people. I think that that really stuck out to me. I hadn't really considered it in that way, but you know, and then I think you know when we when we think about the stories, that idea that we're thrown you know straight into these people's experiences. It is that way of really you know trying to empathise and 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 have an understanding of of what others are going through as well. Yeah, I think that's I think that's great. So. Uh, Kate, that, that's all the questions that I have. I, I want to uh, just finish by saying a, a huge thank you. I think at, at this time, particularly uh, in 2020, with uh, everything that's happened and the disruptions that students have had, for them to be able to access something like this uh, online will be exceptionally helpful to them. So on behalf of them and, and for me personally as well, a huge thank you. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. And I just wish you all the best with doing it. If I, If you guys write a story or find something useful in there and we can use that great power of fiction to make sense of things i'll feel really really repaid really well so i want to just say thank you man thank you good luck you guys i hope it goes well thank you so much for watching our chat with kate kennedy if you are new to the channel please subscribe and take a look around to see if there are any other videos here that can help you out with your vce english journey be they as a teacher or as a student if you're a guest who just came along because you are a fan of kate's work thank you very much uh, for watching and enjoying and we'll see you next time all the best